Um, I'm Susan Hill, and I'm going to welcome you to Hill Farm. We are high tunnel growers, is what we like to call them. Yeah, high tunnel, and a high tunnel basically is a greenhouse with no heat. We use no, no electricity, no heat, no resources. We just rely on the sun, and so far it's worked very well. Even with this weather that we had um, this last couple of weeks, it's been pretty brutal. Two degrees in the tunnels. Um, we haven't lost any produce. We grow 12 months of the year, and I'm going to share with you the experiences and the things that we've done that have worked and not worked. Um, so, there we go. Okay, this is, whoops, we're back. Okay, this is Hill Farm. We're growing in four, four high tunnels. We started with this small one over here on the side, and that was our first experiment with this. At that time, we hadn't really thought about growing for market, but I started getting this tunnel because I was very frustrated as a vegetarian on trying to find produce that was good out of season. Um, most of it shipped from California, very difficult to find good produce in the winter particularly. So we decided that we would go ahead and put up the first high tunnel. So we did that and we did a lot of research on what to build and how to do it. We put it up ourselves about killed us off. But we got it up. <laughs> Trust me, it's not easy to get a high tunnel up. Okay, next one. We built raised beds in the interior. We started thinking about did we want to have people helping us. We opted not to, so there was just going to be the two of us, my husband and I. So we tried to make everything ergonomically sensible for us to be able to pick. At our, we're getting a little older and we're going to keep getting older, hopefully. Um, so anyway, we put raised beds in. We also had bought a tobacco farm, and the quality of our soil was, you can't grow anything on it. So we put these beds in, all in dirt, and started growing. This is me planting uh, transplants of, I believe, beans at that time. We put an irrigation system in because we do not um, believe in wasting a lot of water, so we put drip hoses in, so there's very little waste, and we also don't have a leaching of chemicals down into the soil. We're looking at conservation at the same time. Um, okay, now harvest is ready. It all worked. The irrigation worked. This is probably taken in probably March, something like that. And so we all the things that we had done were together, and we have so much produce. I said, well, let's take it to market. Well, that was, that was a real eye-opener for me. I got on the phone. I was assumed that everyone would want my produce because it was beautiful, right? It looks good. And I called everybody that I could think of. I called all the chefs that said we grow local. I called restaurants. I stopped at the grocery stores. I went everywhere. And nobody would buy my product because they said they didn't buy local produce in Virginia in the winter because no one produced it. And that's when I found out the definition of local produce for most stores is within 500 miles. So they can get their little van, run down to Florida, pick some up, put local on it, and deliver it. So nobody was buying into the idea that you could grow local in the winter. Okay? So we decided we better get back to the drawing board and think about how we were going to make this happen, how we were going to make our product go to market. We realized we have had to find customers because we didn't have any. And then we had to find product that was going to go to market successfully. And we had to figure out the logistics of making that happen. Starting with a plan. And this is what I have to tell everyone, and I, I do a little speaking on this, is that don't just think because you can grow vegetables that you can sell them. You've got to start with a plan. You've got to sit down, you've got to schedule it out, and you've got to figure out what you're going to do. Identify your customers, and you've gotten some good ideas here today. Um, compare market prices. Look at what you're getting. Is it worthwhile to grow kale? Is it worthwhile to grow lettuce? Um, calculate your startup costs. The first tunnel we put up was about $5,000. Um, do you want to go in debt to do these ventures or do you have the cash to do it? Um, time to maturity is very important. How long is it going to take? Do I want to put cabbage in the tunnel that takes 120 days or do I want to put lettuce in that takes 50? Do I want turnover on product? How long does it take? I looked at raspberries. That's one crop and that's all you get. So it works for some people, but it didn't work for me. Um, harvesting, how much manpower does it take to harvest that product? Um, spinach takes a long time. So you might want to think about whether you have enough manpower to pick little tiny spinach for the market. Uh, climate considerations, what can your tunnel handle as far as the, as the cool and heat, as the heat and cold? The trouble with tunnels is the heat. It's not the cold. We've already found out that two degrees works just fine. 
we just covered those little babies up and everybody was happy. I uncovered them yesterday, I was kind of like, but it was okay, everybody was smiling. Um, so climate's a big deal. Uh, labor, we'd already talked about that. We did not want to hire additional labor, so we did everything under our own, our own guidelines. Storage is a huge thing. When I first started, I was running out in the morning, as soon, sometimes with a lantern, to pick fresh produce so that it would go to market really fresh. Because if I picked it the day before, it was all wilted by the time I got there. So this was an issue that we had to think about. Packaging was another one. How did I take that to market where it would be attractive and I could package it? Um, I needed some education on that. And transport, how are we gonna get this product to market? That was the last thing we had to consider. So this is how we have, we've tried to make it happen. First of all, I studied the market. I'm talking, am I talking too fast? I'm trying to get this all in 25 minutes, so. <laughs> all right, so I looked at the market. I went to the grocery store, I talked to the grocers. I looked at how things were packaged, what was pretty, what wasn't, what looked like it was keeping. I went and talked to CSAs. Uh, that's been very successful for some people. It, it didn't appeal to me, so I didn't go that route. I, I have this reluctance to take people's money before I know something's gonna grow, having had a few crop failures. I also had a friend who joined a CSA, and some of them are great. I mean, there's some great ones. And she joined and she gave them all this money and her first package had a carrot, um, an onion and a turnip <laughs> and she said it wasn't quite enough even to make soup so I wasn't going to get I was afraid of that okay excellent and then I started looking at other ways to go that's the local food hub truck and I am a local food hub groupie uh -huh. and I also went to farmers markets and looked at what was going on at farmers markets and some of them were wonderful the one in Charlottesville is great some of them were awful I'm sitting there and I'm looking at buckets of beets in baskets. And we all know that vegetables grow in dirt, but I don't think people really want to see them on their vegetables when they buy them. I think that, that kind of takes something away. And also with the farmer's market, the thing that I saw there was if I picked all my stuff and went to the farmer's market and nobody showed up to buy, what am I going to do with all this produce? Give it to my neighbors, which isn't going to make any money, right? Okay, so we went through all these things. Okay, we can go with one more. Okay, and I selected the crops. That's the next thing that we had to do. We defined our market. I decided I was going to go to the local food hub, and I also go to Foods of All Nations because they were very gracious about, about accepting my product after I finally got a little cooler and walked to all the grocery stores in town. And they were the only ones who were kind enough to let me open it up and show them. And when I did, he said, where did you get this? And I said, I grew it. He said, nobody grows local produce in Virginia in the winter. And I said, well, this is, I did grow it, it was in Louisa. I was finally convinced him of that. Anyway, so now I know my climate, so I'm gonna select the crops that I'm gonna grow. I looked at time of maturity, harvesting, labor, startup costs, and this is where I use for resources. I don't think farmers can get enough resources. I go to all, every conference I can go to, I go to the food hub, where they've taught me how to package my produce. Food safety is a huge issue, we're looking at GAP right now. Um, but these are the things, I went to Virginia State, did all kinds of things with them. The Extension Service is a marvelous resource. You can go online and they'll tell you how to grow vegetables. Um, small farm conferences, libraries. I went to visit at other farms to see what was happening with them. You have to educate yourself on what's going on. And there certainly are, and the seed catalogs are wonderful. Johnny's tells you exactly how long it's supposed to take to grow, what to do with it, the soil temperature. I keep it, it's my Bible and guide that I keep in all my tunnels. Okay, internet research, you can find anything that you could possibly want to know. Okay, so now we're going. This is March greens in the tunnels. We did the, we did the tunnels, that's cedar in between. Um, slugs love tunnels. <laughs> they come in all shapes and sizes and they love tunnels. So we put cedar between. But this is March greens, that's January spinach coming in. So you can do it in this kind of weather. So these are the things, some of the things that we took to market were kind of do our golden beets, and this particular packaging right here for the cherry tomatoes was extremely successful for us in the pine containers. And this is what really saves us right here. I talked about how I had to go out there with a lantern and, and pick produce. Well, now I don't have to do that anymore because my husband built a cool bot. And all cool bot is, is buying that foam insulation, <coughs> 
cut off a little bit of room out of my potting shed, and we lined it with the insulation, <coughs> top, bottom, everywhere, and then you buy an air conditioner and a little thing that changes the temperature on the air conditioner, and I can take it from 90 degrees to about 40 in 12 minutes. I love this cool box. It's wonderful. So we put shelves in there, and we have a walk-in cooler. So I can pick every day of the week, and I can set that to the temperature that I need. If it's tomato season, I want them to be able to keep, so I set it at about 60 degrees. And at 60 degrees, they don't spoil. They're perfect when they go to market. That's very important. If I'm doing lettuces, I can take it to a lower temperature, but I can keep my produce where it needs to be. Um, it's all stuff that's getting ready to go to market right here. And this is, we use packing supplies that are clean. I think that's very important. The food hub is that's that. That's, I hydro cool all of my vegetables. I dip them in water to make sure with the lettuces and I sanitize them to make sure that nobody gets anything from my produce. Um, we use our own packing, we have our own stickers and things. Um, professional scales, when you sell eight ounces of, of produce, you better give them eight ounces or a little bit more. We like to do a little bit more. Um, this is the thing that everybody needs to remember when they're deciding that they want to go into the farming, is first to market, last to market, and fresh to market is where you make money. You really do. Um, do extremely well in the in the wintertime with produce. And like I said, we grow 12 months of the year. Um, in the summertime, we back down and do tomatoes because we're doing artisan types of tomatoes and there's a good market for those. But we don't do zucchinis and things because of the size of our growing area. You need to have acres of zucchini and we can't do enough zucchini in those tunnels to make it worthwhile. Um, this is another example of our first market. These are October. These are October. And we're picking beans, and the tomatoes are still beautiful in the tunnels. And this is the last thing that I'd advise everybody to do, and some of you have touched on this before, and that's keep records. <coughs> keep records, so you have no idea what your production is going to be, what your market was, did it make money. This is from a couple of years ago. We're doing a little better now. But anyway, um, keep track of it. And you'll know that that beautiful kale that you thought was so fun to grow, you didn't make any money at it. <laughs> So don't make, don't grow that. Because if you're, you need to be in this, in this game to make some money. Um, so we keep track, or keep track of our production. We keep track of the cost, and I also keep track of which products worked. You know, I because you can't remember that when you're planting ten different kinds of lettuce. Next year you're not going to remember that the Nevada wasn't big enough for whatever. So we write down which things produce. Keep track of which seed places because not all seed places are the same. Keep track of that too, and then that just all accumulates and we keep those records on Excel spreadsheets. And uh, it's been very <coughs> successful for us. We're having a blast. We really are. Are there any questions? We've got time for a couple. Okay, yes, sir. You use cost share to build these, and does your pro forma uh, include any profitability in the near future or the distant future you need to grow to? Yes, it actually, that's, that's a good question. The first, ton, the first tunnel that we put out, we took out of our savings account, got it going, and the next tunnel that we built, we built with the money we had made from the first tunnel. We saved that, and then we got a grant from the um, Soil Conservation District for another tunnel, and we put that up, and then our fourth tunnel was put up by the profit that we made on the other three tunnels. We're very careful about conserving and, and looking for ways to save money. And, and I think if you get a plan together and you think about the economics of it, you can make that happen. Are you profitable yet? Yes, we are profitable. Mm -hmm. Not greatly profitable, but we are making, well, as I said, we took all the money we made the first couple of years to put back into the business. Now we have no debt to service and have it all the way along and are starting to see probably about all things subtracted, and this year I'll find out better because I'm an accountant, so I'm being careful with this. <laughs> Back in another life. Um, we're probably going to, this year, are, we're anticipating that we're going to make about $500 a month. Um, and I think it's not unrealistic to make 1000 a month. I do. I think and this year will be the telltale year because everything's in place. Yes? Have you considered uh, 
expanding your operation, bringing on staff? And what's been no. the awesome discussions around that? We decided not to do that. Um, I didn't want to get into having to do unemployment and hiring people. And so now my, my force is uh, the grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> Works very well. Uh, They'll pick the bugs off and, and I pay them to come and shovel when we have to regenerate the soil. Yeah, that's my labor force right now and will continue to be. Yeah. We have nine grandchildren. <laughs> so I'm Sam. Yes. You're, you're very fast, uh, and do you make your own soil? No, we we ended up having to buy our soil because we don't have enough compost. I don't know whether we don't waste enough or what. And we don't have animals. And besides that, when you go to your animal manure, you've got to look for the time before you can plant anything in it. And we didn't want to get into that, so we buy ours out in Rutgersville and we get a combination of dirt and compost. They test it very aggressively, it's rose hauling. And they test it, they send it off to labs. We're really comfortable with it. Yes? Obviously this isn't your sole source of, of survival, right? Yeah. No, we're retired. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're both retired. My husband's retired in the Army. Mm -hmm. Yes? How do you irrigate at two degrees? Pardon? How do you irrigate at two degrees? You irrigate at two degrees very carefully. <laughs> um, what I did was I wait the tunnels. When it's two degrees in the morning, it was 76 in the afternoon in the tunnels. It's warm. I mean, it's take your coat off warm. Um, so what I do is I wait until the temperature gets in the 50s, and then I run my water, take my covers off, run my water. You don't have to water much in the winter because there's no evaporation. But you got to give some. So I creep in there when it's about 50, water real quick, and then leave the covers off, and then cover again at 3 o'clock before the, you lose your heat from your tunnel. That's a good question. Is that not your veggies um, to have such a wide temperature span from 70 degrees down to 2 degrees? You know, I thought it would. But you go out there and that lettuce is frozen solid. The first time I saw it, I was like, ugh, I'm in trouble. It thaws, and it's better than it was before it froze. As long as you don't touch it, you can't touch anything. But if you don't, don't disturb it. The beets freeze and then they come back. But actually, the lettuces are the ones that freeze the most, and the rest of them don't really seem to freeze. We keep that cover on them, and they don't, even in that temperature, because you're getting 10 degrees with the tunnel. You're getting about 10 degrees of coverage, and then you're getting another 10 degrees with the cover inside. So you've got 20 degrees. And if you look at the thermometer, we keep it, kept track of that very religiously. If you look at that, you'll see that the time that it's two degrees isn't very long. And you have to have an extended period of cold for that product to freeze. Yes? How big an asset would it be if you had a source of heat that would be economical to keep the temperature above 30 or above or at Yeah, 40? we couldn't find an economical way to do that. We, we thought about it, and then we said, no, we're going to be purists and we're going to go with just the sun. And I think, I think we're going to stay with that, Nathan. <laughs> but we couldn't find it. We looked at different things like wood. You know, sometimes they put wood heaters and stuff like that. But that's very labor intensive. So we decided we were just going to wing it. And so far, it's worked. We may be surprised one day. Hmm? Yes? So in terms of like, you prefer things not normally grown, like citrus, do you prefer things not normally grown Virginia in titles, like citrus or other product, products not normally found here? They're experimenting that with, with that of Virginia State. They're growing papayas now. And it's working, because which surprised me, but it is, and they're doing it in high tunnels. So we're not experimenting with citrus and things. I love to grow in the winter time. Summertime doesn't really interest me, but I do it because we have to continue to build profit on the place. But winter time is the most fun for me. Yes. Uh, how does the heat affect the tunnels in the summertime? Ooh, it's a struggle. Anybody who has high tunnel knows it's a struggle in the summer. You roll up the sides, open the front. So far we haven't used any fans and we've been able to do it. The secret is just to find crops that are heat tolerant. You have to really look at your varieties of tomatoes and things to make sure that they are heat tolerant. We grow lettuce all summer and it's 100 and some degrees in there. Oh. It works. Yes. Have you had any problems with the uh, high winds? So far not. Uh, we haven't had any snow problems and we haven't had any wind problems. Uh, and we've had some pretty severe winds and have not had any tunnel, tunnel damage at all. And we have the Gothic style, so that when it snows, it all falls off. I'm running over, aren't I? No, no, you're fine. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Yes. How do you sanitize How do you sanitize? You use sanitate. Is it? 
it drops in the water. You can do it with bleach. And I just went to a, yeah, everybody goes, bleach. That's how I feel about bleach. But anyway, um, but it's used all over the place. Um, what you do is I have these big, big sinks. And I sterilize the sinks first. And then I rinse the lettuce once. And then I take them out, put new fresh water in. We have our water tested annually to make sure that there's no problem. And then you take drops of, of different disinfectants. There's some that are made out of grapefruit seed extract. There's sanidate, which is made out of peroxide, I believe. Isn't it a peroxide? And um, just put a little bit of that in the water and then dip them in that, and that kills whatever E. coli. We're very careful with our surfaces and cleaning, and it's very intense. Spinach is triple washed, and then it's um, put in the sanidate because people who eat buy spinach generally don't bother to wash it or anything. They just take it out of the bag and eat it. Okay? Yes? What was your aha uh, moment or investment when you thought this is going to work? Was it your cold storage or fire relationship? I think it was the cold storage because it was such a struggle for me to get product ready. But once I learned that we could have that cool bot, which was about a $800 investment for the air conditioner and the cool bot's $299, the little thing that changes it. I think that was the aha moment when we said, this is, this is gonna be successful. And we're still learning. And I think that it's going to become more and more profitable as we do that. But um, we experiment a lot. <laughs> yes? Um, what year did you start? Doing? We started in 2011? <coughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. We're only back this three years, but we're just having a great time. We've really covered a lot of ground. <laughs> My husband never stops. He's always building hoses. Yes. Any more questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate it.